Well, hello everyone. My name is Richard Brother Bell. I am the Vice President of Accessibilities, Diversity and Inclusion for Enterprise. I'm also the co-chair of the Human Rights and Diversity Committee. Um, this program today, where we're going to talk about Africa and the LGBTQI plus um, rights that are taking place, um, the progress that we've seen and what we're hoping to see in the future. Um, I have with me today, um, Carlos and Carlos, would you introduce yourself, please? Sure, thank you so much, Richard. It's so nice to see you. Uh, so my name is Carlos To Zwakala Idibo. That's my full name. And I'm currently working as a Francophone consultant for the um, Resolution 75, 275, uh, which is a resolution that got adopted in 2014 by the uh, African Human Rights Commission. Um, so to put the, uh, the, that in context, it's, um, it's a resolution that many African leaders have been working on, which focus actually on LGBT human rights. And it's also part of the, uh, the whole SOGI uh, SEC agenda. Um, so the component of the resolution 275 um, engage and, and make the, um, the different uh, African countries to commit that uh, they're going to be to contribute in enhancing LGBT human rights uh, on the continent. Uh, so there is an organization called uh, NANRI, the um, Network of um, National African Human Rights um, that is based in, in Nairobi. And they work directly with the African Human Rights Commission. And part of the work that they do is actually to also make sure that the uh, resolution 275 is being implemented, that each country has um, within the National Human Rights Commission, they have like a mechanism to implement the uh, resolution 275. For instance, when uh, there are cases of violences or crime against LGBT people, so the role of the National Human Rights Commission should be to step forward and make sure that there is investigation. And if it's in, in, in terms of crime, that people, the murdered got arrested in jail if that's needed. So I'm working for the Francophone within two Francophone countries, Ivory Coast and Togo around uh, the, uh, that's resolution 75. So it's a lot of, it's a high level advocacy work because it's, a, it's involved like a national human rights commission from different countries on the continent. And beside that, um, as a volunteer work, I'm a resource person for the um, renewal of the uh, uh, expert, uh, independent expert mandate. Uh, independent expert of SOGI mandate, which is one of the, uh, the, 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 the the mandate within the UN bodies. And it's happening right now uh, in Geneva. So I'm here to advocate um, on behalf of Cote d'Ivoire because Cote d'Ivoire is on the list of the country that are eligible to put this here. But as we know, um, many African countries um, criminalize uh, homosexuality, same-sex relation, uh, ship. Um, thanks to the universe, Ivory Coast is not on the list and we don't want it to be on the list, but it doesn't mean that uh, we shouldn't keep doing that work as a work. Um, we should do it. Uh, so hoping that one day we can clearly have in the constitution that the, uh, the government or the whole country acknowledge, recognize and protect um, LGBT human rights in Ivory Coast based on a specific law. Well, thank you for everything that you do. And thank you for being here today, especially with everything you have going on and all the work that you're doing. Um, this program today is part of our uh, Enterprise Rope program. It is a um, racism oppression awareness program um, where we want to bring um, stories, experiences and education um, to the LGBTQI plus um, community around the globe. So we are hoping to address the issues of racism and bias that take place within our own communities, as well as our own um, organizations. So that's why we're, we're meeting today. So once again, thank you for being part of this. Um, Carlos, you, talk, you touched on it a little bit, but what is the state of 
the uh, LGBTQI plus rights in Africa? We know that there are many countries in Africa, mm -hmm. but um, can you give us a synopsis of where we are in regards to queer rights in Africa today? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, as you said, it's a, it's, it's a huge continent. Um, but uh, in terms, like the spectrum in terms of uh, LGBT human rights, it's pretty much the same. Um, expect, as everybody knows, uh, South Africa that has clearly in the constitutions a law that protects LGBT human rights in the home country. But it doesn't mean that at a social level and even at a political level that a, um, everything got fixed, that everything is perfect, that any LGBT you know, folks from South Africa um, is having the best you know, life ever based on the sexual orientation and the gender identity. It's not happening like that. And one of the reasons why it's, it's not happening like that in that specific South African country, it's because historically, um, they, they, they had, they went through appetite, which was basically like uh, showing all the different faces, the ugly faces of racism in one hand. But on the other hand, that um, racism really helped uh, and I'm going to talk specifically for LGBT folks there, uh, since they grew up in this kind of environment where they have to fight. They, uh, they were born and landed, you know, right in the middle of, like, uh, you have to fight to get your right because you're facing directly racism. But it was also sort of like a slavery um, uh, being reproduced within that country. So LGBT folks there, have the journey um, between uh, um, uh, within that kind of reality. So you cannot separate when you look at the um, the LGBT movement in South Africa. You cannot separate that from the uh, the political agenda based on apartheid. That's the reason why you also see strong um, uh, LGBT leaders uh, there in in South Africa as a country, but also South Africa as a region, a sub region. Part of uh, the whole continent. So that's one thing. The other thing is that um, even though um, uh, for, the, uh, for the last almost two decades, the uh, LGBT movement has been growing, significantly growing um, from a country to another country, from a region to another one. Um, but uh, sadly, we uh, we still experiencing uh, the fact that many African countries um, are criminalizing um, are still criminalizing uh, same-sex relationship rights. And that's the reason why um, I was mentioning that um, advocacy, we cannot never stop advocacy work. Um, lately, um, but also when you, when you talk about this, uh, when you talk about this right, you should, we should go back. That's where history become very interesting. So when I say history become very interesting because we cannot separate those reality from the colonization time, you know? So when you look at the African countries uh, colonized by basically by, um, by the British, when you look at the system that is set up in those African countries is completely different from the, uh, the system that we got from France or from Belgium uh, in Francophone African countries. Um, so um, we used to say that uh, because the, uh, the constitution in uh, uh, Anglophone African countries uh, come directly you know, from the, uh, the Commonwealth, from the, um, uh, how can I say that? The, um, uh, the, um, the British uh, constitution, which was based on religion and Puritanism and stuff like that, uh, that we don't have the same realities in the Francophone countries. It's not true because religion was one of the, uh, the powerful weapon that colonizers use at that colonization time to you know, really assimilate countries where they came to change, they said they're coming to, to spread and teach the best civilization and uh, uh, by denying the, uh, uh, the, the, the whole African continent civilization. That's another question that we need to ask ourselves. But now the reality is that within those Francophone African countries, um, we experiencing, um, you know, gay bashing and 
even beyond gibashing, uh, uh, government are criminalizing, uh, reinforcing, you know, the law uh, that criminalized or that was uh, set up to reinforce homophobia within the country. And that's the case of Senegal, for instance. Since 2008, Senegal criminalized, you know, same-sex relationship, and we knew that. But since last year, um, as part of the, uh, the election process, all the uh, religious leaders came out and used homosexuality as another, you know, reason to position themselves and fight against opposition during the election uh, campaign. And I'm, tell, I'm talking about that because it was really like a frightening. You could see thousands and thousands of religion, group of religion, um, protesting, asking for the government to set up laws to kill uh, uh, queer people within the country because it's, it's against, it's, a, it's a immoral, but not only immoral, but it's against the religion, the Islam. So they have to kill them. And some people ended up being in that crowd. Some queer Senegalese people ended up being in that crowd, um, waving those, you know, those signs where they were saying that kill them because that is the devil. But the same people having relationship with other queer people in the country. That's one thing. The other thing is the Togo. That small country, conservative country that we never thought will be on the list. Uh, about a few months ago, I think two or three months. So um, queer people from different organizations were uh, on the beach to have the activity they call, they call like a managing burnout. And then being on the beach, other people are out, were also on the beach. And those other people filmed and took pictures of the queer people. And then that's ended up in fights. So they thought, and then the people who took the, uh, the videos and, and pictures spread out on media, uh, social media. Two days later, the, the Minister of Security made a statement that homosexuality doesn't exist in Togo. And if anybody who is part of that community express uh, like uh, out themselves and openly express themselves, they go to jail. So obviously the whole society took that and then it became like a huge um, attack against the, uh, the LGBT community in Togo to the point that many uh, uh, LGBT leaders have to, to run away from the country, to shut down the offices. Some of them came to, to Cote d'Ivoire, other went to, the, uh, to other countries, uh, the, the neighbor countries. So we're doing the work, we're working hard. But the funny thing is that as we're working hard, our government are also working to worsen you know, the, uh, uh, the homophobia within the continent. So it's not just that there are some specific countries like a Nigeria, like a Ghana um, and, you know, uh, Senegal and other countries, but it's, it seems like a, there is like a, a wind of like a worsening homophobia within the continent that is happening. And that's the reason why LGBT um, folks um, shouldn't sleep because the devil is not sleeping. But beside that, we have also like a victories, you know, like an Angola, for instance. Angola, that small country, um, uh, which is the, one of the, um, the, the countries in, on the continent where they speak Portuguese, um, has been, leaders have been working to advance LGBT human rights uh, and including the work that the government have been doing, you know, beside the LGBT community. So that brings a bit of joy, you know, and smile in our faces. But one country, two countries, three countries on the whole continent, it's nothing, you know, it's, it's really nothing. That's the reason why for us, like um, being part of this campaign to renew the uh, independent experts mandate as part of the UN bodies, it's a very important thing because through that work, he, the person who will take over is not only coordinating, you know, all the reports from LGBT organizations around the world, but they're using those reports to, um, to, to present recommendation and to build like a strong advocacy, you know, um, uh, uh, speeches uh, to address to the UN 
that the UN will uh, take back to different countries. Because at the end of the day, countries come here, you know, to present the report on, you know, what we call the um, periodic uh, universal exam, which is basically like a reporting on the human rights situation in the home country. But unfortunately, many countries have not been including the LGBT report within, you know, the, uh, the, the, the whole country report. So which means that as the LGBT, you know, leaders, we also needed to work on our own report and then come to the UN to present that. And by doing that work, we're supporting the uh, independent expert mandate. That's the reason why it's so important to have the person representing as a working as an uh, independent expert. Uh, uh, so for SOGI within the uh, the UN body, so in in general that's uh, that's that's the picture, and then you have the realities within each country, uh, depending on the context that LGBT folks are working on. Absolutely, <clears throat> and what we're learning here in the United States that um, once you fight to attain these uh, rights, you know, you receive these rights, you have to fight to keep them. Um, as you know, as the world is aware of what we're dealing with now with constitutional um, guaranteed rights now being eroded by our Supreme Court. So um, we know that that can take place anywhere. We have to stay vigilant. So um, thank you for sharing that. Um, with everything that's going on with the different countries in Africa as, as they fight for uh, queer rights, what can organizations like Enterprise do to help? Um, first of all, I think it's important for enterprise, you know, as an organization, but each individual involved in enterprise to really learn about histories. I think histories, culture, histories through culture and art um, is at the end of the day like a powerful tool of education. It's um, through history we learn a lot. Through history, we um, we um, we pause a little bit to strategize, you know, and think in terms of like, a, what can we do better? This is what the history, this is what the past uh, taught us. But now we've been moving forward uh, because as part of the movement, history shows us that diversity is just happening by itself in a natural, in a very natural way. So it's a very important for um, an organization like Enterprise to learn and to integrate and to include history, like an individual who are part of this, you know, um, uh, uh, this organization, their history, especially those who are still marginalized based on the skin color, based on their origin, based on their gender. Uh, it's important for Enterprise to learn about the history so they can better like uh, frame, you know, the language so they can better um, uh, I think ahead of like uh, uh, what is missing around here, what we haven't done, what are we ignorant, you know, about, and what should we learn about. So um, that's one thing. The other thing is is really like uh, because at the end of the day, since the membership organization, you know, so it's really like a, to connect with. Um, with different organizations as entities, but also with individuals. And, and I'm aware that it's a lot of work to do, but to avoid, you know, the fact that using the word global or international, just for the sake of using those words, I believe that an organization like Interprint should come closer to people who without them around, enterprise cannot exist, you know? They need to strengthen, they need to, um, to, to, to focus on the humanity, the, uh, the human aspect of that organization because at the end of the day, it's about human beings, regardless of where we're coming from, regardless of our background, um, it's about human beings, regardless of the systems that unfortunately um, got uh, strengthen and reinforce over years. Um, we don't. We don't want to see you know an organization that is um, uh, through the way they uh, they are operating is just um, shaking the trauma you know within people because those people have been 
uh, going through system uh, like an oppressing system from an oppressing system to another oppressing system. We rely on those organizations like Enterprise and even other organizations that we creating. It's because there is a hope that somehow through those organizations, things can change, the narrative can switch and change. That's the reason why you know, we, uh, we come and go. That's the reason why we're being involved. So to, to not get into any kind of like a perfection, because we as a human being, we're not perfect. We're trying to improve things. And I believe that enterprise people and bodies and different component of like the entities can do that effort to humanize uh, the organization based on the kind of politics that they can set up. Um, on top of my head, um, if I would say like a things that could uh, automatic change, it's really like, a, like a, to create that space, to give that space to uh, individuals who are enjoying or want to enjoy uh, being you know, within that space to, to do the work, to bring the, the, the little the, the token, the little knowledge that they, uh, they know to improve things. Because at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's like, uh, we need to bring, each of us need to bring, you know, something to build that house where we will feel at home, you know? So it's a community organization and we need entrepreneurs to operate as a community, you know? Not another institution that will come up with a political agenda. And if we, if there is a political agenda that we need to put on the table, I believe that it's a kind of political agenda that um, has like a, a strong community, you know, um, uh, uh, how can I say that, vision, you know, otherwise we're just making the community work a worse political agenda than politicians themselves. You know, so that's those are the kind of things that I um, I can say about enterprise, but I don't. Uh, on the other side, I'm happy to see that you know things have been improved. Things have been in things are in being improved because there are some people in enterprise space that are not sleeping, that are not quiet, that are pointing you know thing out to say, hey, if not seeing it, I'm here and I can help you to see it. So that's like a, a very strong you know, step forward um, and it's improving and we're seeing that it's improving, but more still need to be done. Yeah. Do you see a world pride in one of the countries of Africa in the near future? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, of course. And that should have, that should have happened long time ago. You know, but as well, I was talking about the history. That's another thing because uh, some people in our spaces will just stuck with the fact that with the, what they heard, you know, they will stuck with that kind of thought, and then they will build their own, you know, uh, stereotypes. They will build their own beliefs, you know, based on what they heard. But they didn't do any kind of like a research by themselves, or they didn't say that, okay, you know, um, I'm obviously not rich, but I can go and see what's going on in, really in that country, you know, before building my own statements. You know, that has not been happening as part of the history, as part of our organization history. So obviously, people cannot understand what's going on in different countries. You know, there are countries where, yes, we don't have law, you know, protecting, but it's not really when you look at, there is a conversation about laws and there is a conversation about human rights. You know, both can be put together to reach the goal. But then when you look at, it's completely different. The conversation, the, 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 uh, the discourse around human rights, it's a completely different about the law. Individuals set up laws because that's what they feel like uh, will work better for them. That's what they can use to punish, you know, those who they think that are not doing what they're expecting to do. While human rights is really to remember any countries, even though there is no law criminalizing, you know, same-sex relationship with any country, to remember that it's a universal fact 
you know. So regardless of what's going on in the country, you have the obligation of respecting those human rights, you know. And that's the reason why we're fighting for. That's the reason why we can never stop fighting, you know. So yes, there are countries. It's just because we never took time to explore those countries, you know. I will give the case of Ivory Coast, for instance. From last year to this year, to this half year that I've been here, so many queer activities happen in this country, in, in, in Cote d'Ivoire. You know, people will ask me, like, uh, well, one thing is that the country is progressive, you know, compared to other countries in the South region and even in many, compared to many other countries. But we're still scared, like, uh, what is the strategy that you use? Like, uh, what can we count on? And I go like, uh, well, there are many hotels here. There are many venues that we've been working, you know, to educate them so they can become gay friendly. And networks, board members, big events have been happening in Cote d'Ivoire. You know, just because we've been doing some advocacy and education work on the staff to help them understand that first of all, it's about human being and second, you're doing business. So, because we need to use the, 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 you know, the diversity, the accessibility and inclusion language as well with like a private corporation. You're doing business. And the first thing for you is like a financial interest. Are you looking for individual, like what's going on in the bedroom or are you looking for money? That's one thing. And, and but also beyond the, the fact that there is a financial interest, as I said, it's about human beings. Like uh, you have all this chart in your organization, in your hotel that is promoting human rights. And then at the same time, you say that you, can, you don't want to see other people. So we use their own you know, word, we use their own policies to challenge them. And that's how we've been uh, succeeded in, in building like uh, some gay friendly private corporation, including hotels. You know, so we're doing that work within the country. There are other venues, even outside of the big cities, where like a, in, in countryside or in small town, where uh, uh, queer uh, uh, activities have been happening without any kind of like a police or gay bashing and things like that. And we think if those people are understanding, when will come the time to talk about like uh, having a specific law within the constitution that clearly states that the country is protecting, the constitution is protecting LGBT human rights. We have all those people around us to support this kind of like a advocacy, you know? So it's about strategies. Beside Ivory Coast, the other countries, like uh, in, this, in, in, in South Africa, for instance, and in South Africa as a region, as a sub region, but also South Africa as a country, you know? And we're doing this work from a, from a sub-region to another sub-region. And that's how we can get a lot of venues within the continent. And we need to stop being stuck with this idea that, oh, there is a devil in, in the African continent. We can not go there, at least not for now. We haven't tried. We haven't tried, you know. So if we, we don't try and if we keep having this kind of word, it's mean in, in, in one hand, we're not acknowledging the hard work that African leaders have been doing since the beginning of like uh, the, uh, the 21 centuries and even before that, you know? So let's open our mind to understand. And even you, Richard, you had the opportunity to come to South Africa and you saw, you know, that's the reason why I said, yes, I mean, we need money to travel, but it's not just about the money. You know, we, when we're doing this kind of work, we need to educate ourselves. We need to find opportunities to educate ourselves. You know, we need to be like a, to witness so we can be the better ambassador on spaces where prejudice and stereotypes are still going on. You know, so yeah, that's uh, the answer that I can give to that question. And that leads us to um, my final question for you. Um, for those of us, particularly in um, North America or in you know parts of Europe where 
we have this freedom to um, be with the people we choose to love, those kind of things. We have those rights that so many other nations are fighting for. Um, when it comes to visiting nations that don't have that rice, those rights, we have a struggle. Do we visit or do we not visit as a form of protest? Um, so with Africa, is this a place that those of us who are part of the queer community should visit? Um, of course, there is this, uh, there is the, uh, the security agenda, you know, it's important for us as the activists, as the uh, queer leaders, um, to be aware, you know, of those security or insecurity in different countries, regardless of the country where we hope, you know, we can go for vacation or just to learn, you know, what other queer people are doing there. That said, um, yes it's not um, uh, safe to come to some of African countries, you know. But as I mentioned on the question around like, uh, if it's possible to do like uh, any, to, to like uh, host any kind of conference, it's pretty much the same thing when you're planning some vacation. You don't want to go to places where you know that even through the basic things, you're exposing yourself, you know? That's one thing. The other thing is also like, um, we need to remember that even though we are in countries where we have the freedom, but that freedom didn't happen over didn't happen overnight. There was a fight. There was a struggle. There was like a there were there were killings. Some people died before we got to the point. So when we go into countries, let's say I so want to go, for instance, to Uganda, or I so want to go to Senegal, then I need to learn based on what I just told you about Senegal, what's happening in Senegal. I will go to Senegal, but I need to behave. I just need to behave. Because one thing that we forgot, or we keep forgetting as queer person, is that we are part of the society. There is no a world that just belongs to queer people. And I believe that we don't even want to have our own world. You know, we don't want other people to separate us from the rest of the, uh, you know, the, the, the world and the society. So there is a common principle, like a living principle that is important that as individual, as human being, we should follow. And then when it comes to human rights, there is other principle that we should also follow as a queer people. We need to be aware of that. It's important. I went to Senegal a few weeks ago that's where I was living. I used to live in Senegal. I was working there back in 2004. And then in 2020, 20, uh, 2022, there is a situation where as a queer person, you cannot just you know, be who you are. So my responsibility as an activist, as a community leader is to behave, to be a model, you know, to tell people that, hey, now that anytime you're going to Senegal, it's not about being paranoid, but you have to be aware. You have to be aware. You can go to spend your vacation and it, yeah, but make sure that you connect with people that you can rely on. You know, you can have your little safe circle, you know, and walk around with those people and some places that you should avoid. You know, it's everywhere in the world. Yes, of course, other people are advanced than other. Some people are advanced than other people, but the security or insecurity, the safety uh, conversation, we as a queer people, we need to be aware. It has to be like at the number one of the way we live, regardless of where we're living. You know, so that's that's what I I can say about like uh, visiting African countries. You need to you need to learn your your lesson. You need to do your homework before going somewhere, you know? Because even though you don't carry on your head uh, the activism, uh, you don't wear the activism hat, you're not seeing you coming, you know, far away with like the rainbow, you know, flags all over you, but you still, as a human being, you need to be aware of what's going on around you, you know? So that's a, that's a thing that we need to say. And I think we should have that in, uh, Interpret is already doing that. We have the mapping, you know, thanks to Ilga World, we have the map of different countries where it's not safe, but it's like a, 
uh, huh, I can go, but I have to behave and where I can go and then wearing my like a uh, rainbow suit. And, you know, we have those places where we can enjoy ourselves. For now, let's choose those places and still working on making the other places progressive. Sounds like yeah. a plan. Yeah. Well, Carlos, thank you for taking the time to um, to meet with me today and um, answer these questions and give us a little bit uh, more information about what's going on in Africa for um, our community and what we can do to help. Um, as you mentioned, I visited South Africa. You know I want to come to Cote d'Ivoire. Um, that is, is certainly a goal of mine, and hopefully we can make that happen soon. Looking forward to it. Um, but once again, thank you again for taking the time to meet with us today, and I look forward to chatting with you again real soon. Yeah, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share my little experience, and especially to keep running this program, Rope. It's really, really important. That will help to better understand how racism looks like in different parts of the world, but especially to uh, work on better strategy to uh, dismantle, you know, racism, regardless of the face that it has. So thank you so much for keep running this program. My pleasure. Look forward to seeing you soon. Yeah. Bye for now. Bye.